he shot himself with my finger. His finger with your finger in there, but that's not really possible. Technically, you pulled the trigger. Hi everyone, I'm Kevin and thanks for joining me today. Here at Just Thought Lounge, we like to take a close look at interesting and thought-provoking cases, so if you're curious and you enjoy true crime, then you've landed in the right spot. Today's case is about Amy Herrera, whose husband Mark was found by police in their closet, dead from an apparent suicide following a party the couple hosted in their home in June 2012. But things were not quite that clear. Amy said that it was her finger that was on the trigger, but that it was her husband that made her do it. Let's take a look. Mark Herrera was stationed at Kirkland Air Force Base in Albuquerque with the 550th Special Operations Squadron when he started dating Amy. She was Amy Collins then, married to TJ Collins and employed by the University of New Mexico Department of Family and Community Medicine. Amy and her then husband had moved to the area when he was attending the university as a graduate student. In May 2009, at the age of 27, Amy's first marriage came to an end and she divorced TJ. Amy and Mark were married in February 2011. The marriage would last 16 months. Air Force Major Mark Carrera was 38 years old, his wife Amy 30 in 2012. They shared a home in Albuquerque near the junction of Wontabo and Eubank. They had two dogs but no children. This was apparently a bit of a sticking point with the couple. Mark was keen on having children, but Amy was reportedly less enthused. There was one other noticeable stain on their marriage. In June 2011, Mark was accused of harassment at work. A joke of his had offended a woman officer, an incident serious enough for the Air Force to strip Mark of his earned promotion to Lieutenant Colonel. Friends said he was taking the lashing in stride, but it was a significant hindrance in his career. Regardless, the couple appeared publicly to be quite happy and very easygoing people. Through a program with the University of New Mexico, they hosted an Ecuadorian exchange student in their home. They were described as a seemingly perfect couple, the pilot and the pretty career woman. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Robin Gallant said the two seemed quite affectionate. They both liked to party. Mark was described as a jovial drinker, never violent, and Amy was a woman with a remarkably high tolerance for booze. Air Force Master Sergeant Carlos Garcia said the couple were fun-loving. Mark was reliable and trustworthy. Amy was funny. Neighbors described them as a normal and quiet couple. There were no outward signs of distress or aggression in the marriage. They were a very quiet couple. Uh, they said hello when I saw them. You know, she would go to work, he would go to work. Never heard a meowing, never, you know, any noise around the house or the backyard. On the 30th of June 2012, Mark and Amy were hosting a party for a group of exchange students from the university at their home. Everyone had been drinking. Mark's drink of choice was Jack Daniels and cola. Amy was said to be enjoying multiple double shots of coconut rum with a few of the students. As the party wound down around 3 or 4 a.m. the next morning, the students were asked to stay over, but they were consciously separated by gender into different bedrooms. This is where the scene heats up. Mark became upset when he found a male student chatting with female students in an upstairs bedroom. Apparently the students were not in their separate rooms. In order to force them to separate, Mark grabbed and pointed a loaded 45 caliber pistol at the male student. Amy, called by other students to the room, got in between Mark and the male student and de-escalated the situation. She told Mark to put the gun down and go to the couple's bedroom, which he did. This is where the stories diverge. Accounts of what happened next inside the master closet differ, but they began to argue. According to Amy, she was in the walk-in closet taking off her earrings when Mark pushed her to the floor, sat on top of her, and aimed the gun at her face. She said, I thought he was going to shoot me. I was absolutely sure. And then when he didn't, he put the gun in his own mouth, then he put it in my hand saying that I was going to do it. And then I pulled the trigger. I was in the closet taking my earrings off. Okay, and then he entered the closet? He came in after me and okay. pushed me down. What happened after he pushed you down? He pushed me down, he had me in the corner. He was talking. A 911 call is made and the Albuquerque Police Department, the APD, arrive on the scene to assess. 
When police arrived, they found a group of foreign exchange students crying and speaking to officers in broken English, stating there was a victim upstairs in the closet. They noted that Amy had visible blood on the front of her clothing and the back of her legs. They found Mark on his knees, slumped over, in a face-down position inside the master closet. A field investigator was called to the scene. Since Mark was in the Air Force, an Air Force investigator was also there conducting an independent inquiry. In addition, a medical investigator was requested. According to initial medical reports, what happened to Mark appeared to be self-inflicted. The decision was made at the scene not to make a full violent crimes call out. The investigators questioned Amy and examined her bruises. They compared other physical evidence against her version of events. However, Amy's hands weren't tested for gunpowder residue and she never underwent a toxicology screen. The scene was treated like a suicide. An autopsy was conducted on July 2nd, which was the first full day following the call out to the house party. It confirmed that Mark had a blood alcohol level of 0.23, which is extremely high. The injuries sustained were cracked teeth, a laceration of the length of the tongue, but most notably there was no obvious soot found in the mouth suggesting that the gun was not placed there. On the same day, a search warrant was issued for the house. When the APD arrived, the house appeared to be cleaned throughout. The closet where the altercation took place was completely emptied of its contents. It was discovered that the Air Force personnel had entered the home earlier in the day and assisted Amy in her request to clean the home and to clear it out. Detective Holly Anderson contacted Amy on July 3rd to request a formal interview to which the young widow agreed. It took place in the law enforcement center. Amy tells the detective that Mark had essentially committed suicide. Well, it was my finger, but he did it. She states again that the gun was in his mouth when the trigger was pulled. She says that Mark was holding her wrist with one of his hands and they were struggling back and forth. Amy said that Mark insisted that she follow through with it. He was in control, she said. When asked whether the control was physical, Amy says no. He was controlling her metaphorically. She technically shot him. The detective found that Amy's reenactment of the events and her story were not consistent. Asked why Mark would want to do this to Amy, she says that it was the ultimate suffering. To make her pull the trigger was to make her live with that for the rest of her life. She told the detective that it was the last thing that she wanted to do. The information from the interview was relayed to the district attorney's office and the recommendation from the APD was that a further investigation be undertaken if possible. The recommendation appears not to have been adopted. The death was formally ruled a suicide stemming from the initial assessment at the scene. So in the months following, Amy received a death annuity payout of $100,000. Her husband's life insurance at a value of $400,000 was still pending. During this time, Mark's family, particularly his mother, Marion, while grieving, also began to ask questions about the lack of effort being made in Mark's case. I want them to do their job, and I pray that they're doing it well. The Herrera family had never had the opportunity to get to know Amy. They admit that after only a year and a half of marriage, she was still a stranger to them. Some of Amy's past was dug up in the immediate aftermath of Mark's passing. According to the news outlet KRQE in Albuquerque in 2012, Amy had also lost her first husband to suicide shortly before her marriage to Mark. Amy was separated from her first husband, TJ Collins, and on the path to a divorce when his body was found, according to the news report. His father did not want to do an interview, but did tell the reporter that his son, who was a University of New Mexico grad student, was never suicidal. He says his son's marriage vows four years earlier meant everything to him, and that he found his son's suicide very strange. 
Not to overemphasize this point though, in searching this down further, it seems that the Albuquerque Journal reported in 2015 that court documents show Amy's divorce had completed in May 2009 and TJ had taken his life less than two weeks after that. He was found hanging in his closet, he had a blood alcohol level of 0.21, his death was ruled a suicide. After concerns were raised by the Air Force investigator and by Mark Herrera's parents, the APD assigned a violent crimes detective to the case. Amy Herrera was the focal point of the investigation. Detective Anderson wrote that the location of blood and brain matter on Amy's purple dress and the back of her legs, the position of Mark's body, and the lack of substantial gunpowder residue in his mouth for starters appeared inconsistent with Amy's version of events. Then, in September 2012, the first of three witnesses told police that Amy had admitted to killing her husband. The witness says she confessed to them, I shot him. This was followed by the witness asking whether she was forced to. Amy's response, no, I killed him. But she doesn't think that she will be arrested because the death will be considered either accidental or justified. With this new information, an arrest warrant is issued for Amy. The warrant was based on the discrepancies in her statements and evidence from the scene. The manner in which the gun was fired was not consistent with her account. Experts consulted said that how Mark was positioned in the closet did not align with him being on top of her and holding her down, and the medical examiner, with new information to review, now concluded that this was not a suicide, but consistent with homicide. Amy Herrera was arrested on October 11, 2012. The prosecutor bungled this first attempt to get an indictment, however. Apparently, the detectives attempted to demonstrate a theory of the shooting to the grand jury counter to appropriate practice. Their attempt at an indictment was thrown out. They needed to try again. A second indictment, this one for second-degree murder, was also tossed out after the state Supreme Court agreed that the prosecution had failed to act in a fair and impartial manner when instructing the grand jury, among other concerns. This attempt failed because of the instructions to the jury to ignore certain testimony and the testimony in question was key to Amy's potential defense. The defense had asked that the grand jury be allowed to hear the testimony of a co-worker and friend of Amy's, Elizabeth Downs. Amy had confided in Elizabeth only weeks before the June party that her husband had previously attacked her and threatened to kill her. Elizabeth said that the two women had discussed an escape plan for Amy in the event that she felt it was too dangerous to stay in her home with Mark. Mark uh, was drinking a lot, and he was getting more violent. Um, she told me that it was, she, he was shoving her on the bed against the wall, and also that he gets the gun. In August 2014, prosecutors again presented their case against Amy Herrera to a grand jury for an indictment, and apparently third time's the charm. This time, a three-day preliminary hearing ended with Amy being set for trial on a charge of second-degree murder. But Amy's story had changed in the intervening years. She no longer claimed that she did not kill her husband. She did it, but it was self-defense. Gentlemen of the jury, I submit to you, this is not a difficult case. It's not rocket science. The evidence will show that Mark Herrera drank a ridiculous amount of alcohol that night. Amy claimed that Mark was abusive. His drinking had escalated and so had his bad behavior. She was asked if she ever went to the hospital due to her injuries. She said, not to the hospital, no. He was a highly trained black ops pilot in the Air Force. One time that he choked me, he made a point to show that he was going to crush my windpipe because it wouldn't leave any marks, and that they had trained him to do that correctly. Following this, she and her friend Elizabeth had mapped her escape plan. At trial, the testimony of those that Amy had confessed to was perhaps the most damning. Stephanie Taylor, whose husband was in the Air Force with Mark, testified that Amy had shocked them at an August 2012 dinner at their home when she casually blurted out, so you guys might as well know, it's gonna come out anyway, I killed him. Witness Garcia testified that he too had been shocked when weeks after Mark's death, Amy had called him, angry over finding receipts and other evidence that Mark had indulged in dating sites and strip clubs. Amy had just opened a credit card bill for Mark and discovered the membership fees to Ashley Madison, the dating website for married individuals seeking to have affairs. I wish I could kill him again, he said she told him. We heard a rumor and she was like, well, what's that? And I said that Mark had died and she said, oh, it's true. That's when she went into rather graphic detail. Did she happened? describe what she wanted to tell you as the truth? 
Yes. Okay. Um, what did she tell you? What details did she tell you? That she killed Mark. Amy's defense attorneys portrayed Mark's fall from grace as the catalyst for his growing issues with anger and alcohol. They said that after Mark was accused of harassment and refused his earned promotion to lieutenant colonel, his bad behavior began to escalate. Her career had been seriously derailed, and he'd almost been, he'd almost been kicked out of the Air Force. At some point, he was relieved that they didn't kick him out. Witnesses for the state countered that Mark had taken it all in stride, happy to be transferred to Kirkland Air Force Base, where he remained a pilot. Not so, said Elizabeth Downs, who testified that Amy had confided that Mark was drinking too much and that his actions were worsening. Liz, she testified, Amy told her, he's crazy. The trial lasted through five days of witness testimony. Closing arguments in the case focused on how many times Amy had changed her story. It was all too inconsistent to be accepted as the truth. She thought through that he was going to be better off to her dead than alive. She thought through that she no longer wanted him in this world. The defense focused on the nature of their relationship. Far from the perfect couple that had been described by friends and neighbors, the couple had deep-seated issues. Amy had grown accustomed to lying for Mark, to covering up the truth, and she had lived in fear of him. The judge told the jury to decide one of three outcomes, guilty of second-degree murder, guilty of voluntary manslaughter, or not guilty by self-defense. The jury deliberated for three hours. In August 2017, five years after she was initially accused, Amy Herrera was found not guilty by self-defense in the death of her husband, Major Mark Herrera. She and her team had no comments after the verdict was read. Some in the press have commented in the aftermath that the verdict was less of a vindication than a failure to prove what had happened beyond a reasonable doubt. No one but Amy can know what really happened in the closet that night. Mark Herrera's family and friends filled much of the courtroom throughout the trial. After the verdict was read, his parents said that they were disappointed but relieved that the process was finally over. I want to thank the jury for their hard work. I know they made the best decision they could. A verdict of not guilty does not change the truth and does not change the facts. I know who murdered my son. I know where she did it, and I know when she did it, and I know how she did it. Unlike so many of the cases that we examine on this channel, this one does have a definitive conclusion. But what do you think of it? Let me know your thoughts. Thanks once again for joining me. I'm Kevin, this is Just Thought Lounge, and I'll see you in the next one. Well, I might just go and stab him again. But... All right, do not stab him again. Why? All right, madam, how many times have you stabbed him?